Welcome to Thinking About Magic, everybody. We're, we're glad to have you wherever you're tuning in from this Friday evening. If you're a magician uh, or in the entertainment industry, you're very busy. So we really appreciate you being here with us tonight. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm doing pretty good, my friend. How's it going, Braden? It's going really well. I heard you're not just doing pretty good. You're doing <laughs> really good. You are going to be joining uh, one of our guests today, uh, Jeff McBride, in his new upcoming show, Story yes. Master. Yes, absolutely. So the Story Master is going to be on December 18th, Braden, and it's 12 p.m. and also 6 p.m. And I'm going to pull up a, a, a little picture up here so that you can see that this is our guest for the evening. And he is going to be doing a new virtual show. And that is only one day, the Story Master. And it's going to be pretty good, Braden. And I'm pretty excited about it. I have one little story to tell on the on the on the story and i think judge brown is going to be there and also abigail if i'm not mistaken yes it's going to be a wonderful night of storytelling and magic if you've seen uh magic quest or uh monsters myth and magic or monsters masks and magic you know uh you know you're in for a real good treat so get your tickets there's only two show times available we'll have the links for you uh in in the facebook chat so we're very happy that you're here tonight. And I want to talk to you, viewers. You're the fifth panelist. Wherever you're tuning in from, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, your comments, your ideas, your questions, your thoughts matter to tonight's conversation. We'll be sure to break away from time to time if we get moments in between the wisdom that Jeff will drop and Napoleon as well. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, hi, yeah. Nick. Hey, buddy. How are you out there? See you popped in. Our buddy Nick is out there. So, you know, uh, hello to you, my friend. And just to let you know, Braden, I threw out a link um, as far as where they can get tickets to the Story Master when uh, Jeff is Jeff McBride is going to be playing on December 18th. So it's in the link. Click on that and you could get your tickets there. Awesome. And I see Alexander Pinedo had said hi as well. So thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Wherever you're tuning in from, go ahead and say hi. Yes. We're going to introduce we're going to introduce our guests because we got to jump into it. We got to get into this. We're in the holiday spirit. We're in this the season of storytelling and we really need to get into all that Jeff has to offer for us today. So without any further waiting, we'll introduce Napoleon first. Napoleon is an actor and magician from London and Napoleon is based out of Los Angeles. Napoleon, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Um, hi. <laughs> hey, Napoleon, I know you've been very busy. Uh, you just got back from a gig. How has the season been treating you so far? Uh, hectic, very hectic, but great. Great to be uh, out in front of audiences again. Good, 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 good. Well, we're going to introduce our next guest. Jeff is known as one of the world's most innovative and exciting magical performances. Uh, his shows have won rave reviews and standing ovations in Vegas showrooms, theaters, and arenas around the world. Jeff is the author of The Show Doctor and is the creator of the Trilogy of Trilogies, which is the best-selling series on the art of stage magic and manipulation of all time. McBride Magic and Mystery School is the most prestigious magic school in the world. And as a keynote speaker uh, and thought leader for 30 years, Jeff has inspired thousands of performers, including myself and Napoleon and Chris as well. I think you'd agree. And is considered by many to be the world's leading educator in the art of magic. Please welcome the award-winning master of magic, Mr. Jeff McBride. Well, it's wonderful. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. And here I am at the Magic and Mystery School. And if you don't know me, that's why I carry this and this. <laughs> so I'm so happy to be part of your show. You've been coming to our classes and our shows for a long time. And it's great to be able to give back to your project here. So let's rock this. Well, we really appreciate it. We'll kick it off with uh, a quote from uh, the former dean of the McBride Magic and Mystery School and your mentor, Eugene Berger. And he said... Magic, above all else, must be deceptive. And he said it in the only way that he can. 
Uh, so with that, uh, in our magical performances, Jeff, why is deception so inextricably linked to wonder and astonishment? I studied with Juan Tamarez in Europe, and he tells a great story when people ask him, what is more important, technique or presentation? Talking about magic being deceptive. And he tells a story. He says, well, you tell me. Imagine you're invited to an exquisite dinner and you get an invitation in the mail and it is calligraphy and on vellum paper and a car arrives to pick you up and it takes you to a palatial estate. There's candles lining the staircase. You walk up to this grand event. There's fresh cut flowers. There's music playing and you walk into the dining hall and the servants bring you your dinner under a silver dome and you start eating and the food tastes like crap. Are you ever going to go back to this place? Does that spoil the experience? Well, the technique is the meal. The presentation surrounding it is essential. But Eugene really stressed, along with Tamarez, that the technique of the magic has to be deceptive. And sometimes in magic, the magician is deceiving themselves the most during rehearsals and even performances. And Eugene would, would, would laugh and say, you know, often magic is exposed not by the masked magician as much as it is by inept performers performing bad technique. So yes, the experts agree Magic to be effective must be, um, you know, you must have good technique. Yes, and be deceptive. Napoleon, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, I mean, you know, I think mag being deceptive is kind of the baseline, really. I mean, if you're if you're not being deceptive as a magician, but you're doing something else, like you're manipulating objects, you're kind of juggling. If you're telling jokes, you're doing comedy. If you're moving around the stage to music, you're dancing. So, you know, you have to have deception or else it isn't really magical. And obviously, the better your technique, the hopefully the more deceptive what you're doing will be. I mean, entertainment is, is slightly different to that, but it is related. But obviously, if you want to fulfill the criteria for magic as an art form, I think, you know, you have to be deceptive. And when it comes to the deception, Jeff, you had mentioned that sometimes we deceive ourselves as magicians. Yes, I see this with, with videos and I see this in practice all the time. And I wrote about it in my book, The Show Doctor. We as performers, as practitioners of magic, often edit out our mistakes while we're practicing and while we're performing. And you and I can I I I saw this happen when I started to teach magic 30 years ago with Eugene at the mystery school. We had a performer performing the linking rings and their routine was fine. However, every time they linked the rings and every time they unlinked the rings, they blinked. And this was a guilty tell. And I stopped the performer because we were in a workshop situation and we agreed to this dynamic. And I said to Eugene, I said, just watch the performer's eyes now. And, and we watched this back on videotape and it was literally eye opening because you see performers, they'll, 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 they'll take a ball, they'll go to vanish it and they'll blink right at the moment of the slight that happens or they'll blink right at the moment where the, the object appears or during many of the other techniques of the magician, how they acquire objects and how they, ditch these objects, there's an involuntary tell. And <clears throat> it's not just the eyes. Sometimes you can see it in the body language. And again, when people are speaking, they subconsciously touch their neck and they do these little tells or they'll start shifting. They'll rock back and forth if they're telling something that isn't truth because this is kind of a comfort mechanism that makes them feel better this kind of rocking motion. And it's subtle, but you can see this happen in, in, in performances all the time. Wow, well said. And the book, The Show Doctor, not only does it go through 
blinks, but you also have some multimedia that if you get the book, you have access to videos that's you teaching the material. So I recommend everyone get this, not just for the blinks, but for all of the other great pieces of magic. There's Toastmasters is one of the, the pieces in here that I love. And uh, it's really uh, an incredible, innovative approach to a book. So thank you, Jeff, for that. And I will go to Meadow. Uh, she has a, a comment there. And it really dovetails on what you said, Jeff. Meadow says the magician skill is one of the hardest things to overcome. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, what There's this thing in business, uh, in the worlds that I am, called the imposter syndrome. And it's a whole thing developed on, and it, and it impacts self-confidence. It impacts, it's the idea that uh, you're presenting a, an untrue version of yourself when you're, when you're doing something in business. Uh, does that come over into magic? Is that something magicians uh, deal with, Jeff? Pre pre presenting a false face? Never. <laughs> Are you kidding? It's all over magic. I think magic is, as, as Max Maven said years ago at Mystery School, he'd say, most young boys and young girls get into magic around seven years old because they find magic a viable coping mechanism. You see they're having trouble dealing with their siblings at home or their teachers or parents at school, or, and they find that if they can make the little coin vanish, that's power. So a lot of young people get into magic because they don't maybe excel in other areas. But if they can pretend and make believe that they have these magical powers, they gain status. And when that status is challenged by another person in school, that can be devastating to the would-be magician, getting the deck taken out of their hands. Let me see that. You can't do that. So there is a lot of social posturing with magicians that happens that starts at a very young age. And it, it is, you know, it's, it's habit forming because having this secret knowledge that adults don't have above you, you know, empowers you. And when it's taken away, when it's shown that you don't really have these powers, it's it can lower you socially. Wow. And it kind of goes to the idea that, you know, who are you without the tricks? You know, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, Chris and I were talking before the show and we were just reflecting on the fact that some of the pieces of magic that we do, and I'm sure you're this way as well, Jeff and Napoleon, is that if something, you know, if it's so it's so integral to your identity, this piece of magic, that if if there's a failure of the prop or you, you know, you're running out of something that you need to make this piece of magic work, that it it almost is a personal affront. Uh, you know, you take that very seriously. Your your confidence lowers based mm -hmm. on the how how many um, you know, coils you have left, let's say, you know, it, there's a there's a direct link to that. Um, it's an intrinsic link. And uh, Napoleon, what are your thoughts on on this topic of the imposter syndrome or anything else? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I, I come late to magic, really. And so for me, uh, you know, I, I don't have 30 years behind me of, of, of practicing uh, coin rolling or any of these things. So for me, um, you know, I know I have tells. My wife tells me that I have tells. I mean, my tell is I become suddenly less uh, vivid I suddenly go into this kind of uh, concentration phase. And uh, it's one of these things that to overcome that, I mean, back to Mero Meadows' point, I mean, I think it's one of these things that either you have someone who tells you, they watch your performance and they tell you very specifically, like a coach or a loved one, and they say, mm, at this point, I knew you were doing something. And in, in my case, my tell is I suddenly look like I'm really concentrating very hard rather than being relaxed or zany or funny or whatever, I, I suddenly just get this kind of look in my eye, like I, I'm trying to do something, whatever that particular thing I'm doing at the moment is. Um, so yeah, so yeah, the imposter syndrome is is definitely a thing because obviously we're not we're not wizards, as far as I know. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, mean, I think Jeff is obviously, but I mean, most of us magicians are not. We don't have supernatural powers, and so uh, you know there is that element of of I suppose you have to kind of you have to have the illusion that you can do this in your mind, whatever it is you're doing. I mean, I think in my case, um, 
I mean, I don't think I'm lying to the audience because I my my goal is to give them a good time for whatever that may be, whichever the audience is. So I think for me, I'm I'm not trying to deceive them. So I think that helps me in a way because I'm I'm not trying to sort of you know I, I'm my goal isn't really necessarily I want to be deceptive and I want to be magical, but I don't necessarily want to deceive them. I want to entertain them more, and so I feel like maybe that gives me a little bit more wiggle room. I mean, I was reading somewhere that uh, Blackstone Senior he did a performance somewhere where he was doing his famous effect, the floating light bulb, and it and it didn't work. And he sort of stepped out very uh, courageously in front of the front row and said, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes magic doesn't work the way you want it to. And that was it. He just moved on with the show, which I thought was very, very interesting that, you know, you're allowed to be human and you're allowed to perhaps have vulnerability. You may not want to have the vulnerability, but I think it's very interesting that you you can perhaps have that, you know, once in a show, if something does go wrong, you can sort of, if it's, impossible to ignore you can make a point of it and then move on to something else i'm gonna i'm gonna chime in on what napoleon said i think that if you add other textures with presentation and in my performances i think i way overcompensated for the guilt of trying to fool people by putting dance and mime and mask and quick change and kabuki and layers of storytelling and all of these other elements. So if the trick don't go right, there's still all of these other textures and dimensions to carry the narrative, the, the, the performance. The problem happens is when it's just about the trick and nothing more than the trick. And, you know, I grew up, you know, it raised Irish Catholic. I was an altar boy, but now, as you can tell, I'm an altered boy <laughs> from my travels around the world. But that was ingrained into you, um, you know, as, as a Catholic school kid, not lying, telling the truth. Guilt was like a bad thing. And you had to go to confession, you know, to the priest and tell them your bad things. This, this was like heavy for a little kid wanting to be a magician. And some of the first magic shows I wanted to do for, for people, you know, I, there was a minister that was like, no, magic is of the devil. It's about deceit and deception. And we're only about truth and righteousness. And I'm going like, is this guy out of his mind? I, I do a dove act. Hello, you know, <laughs> but still people have different perceptions on, on what magic is. And one of the things that, you know, I was exploring with Eugene, which is this shadow side of the magician, is how being good at deception for the audience creeps into our everyday life with answering questions or, you know, the, Abigail wants to go to dinner and it's like an equivoke, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and it's when it creeps into social life, you know, or family life. That's when it that's when it's a whole different animal, isn't it? When you get it, Eugene used to laughingly say, and I think you know this, you know, he would say, Magic, let me do it the right way. <clears throat> magic teaches us to lie without guilt. <laughs> and he always did that with this little laugh, you know. However, Eugene's performances were not just about as he called it, the adventures of the prompts in the magician's hands, any more than Meadows' performances are about magic tricks. She wraps hers in the whole, you know, the, the bubbles and the fairy and the fantasy and all of this character stuff that she is, you know, has, has been refining over the years. So I think if the magic is very textured and multidimensional, that, and it's not a job, just tricking the person, like I say in my show, you know, there's two types of audiences, the people that like try to figure their tricks out and the people that just sit back and enjoy the experience. And Eugene's philosophy, which I carry on, which I was kind of adapting through all the different theatrical elements I added to my magic, is get the people out of their analytical mind, mm -hmm. which is just the opposite of what Penn and Teller are trying to do, which is totally to engage the, 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 analytical mind and break it so there's there's different ways to go at this as eugene used to say you know quoting 
biblical inspiration, there's many rooms in the house of magic. Some just don't feel the pain of guilt <laughs> as much as others. Well, that is a, an amazing tip for everyone that's not feeling like they have to hang everything up on the deception and the lies and the deceit and the trickery. So much of magic now uh, you see in performances uh, is all about the deception. It's all about uh, the trick. And many, many times that presentation is the outright uh, overt presentation. It's about the trick. And, and, I Eugene wanted... used to, and Eugene used to say, with magicians, since this is mostly a magician's audience, sometimes the most deceptive thing about the trick that you've just purchased is the ad that made you buy it. <laughs> So true. So true. I, I was just clearing out some clutter today going, I remember when I bought that last week, why did I buy that? <laughs> that's and that, Eugene used to say, and that's why the, that's why the good Lord invented eBay. <laughs> that's fantastic. I want to call up a couple comments that came in, Chris, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, no we'll bring up Meadows uh, comment. Um, 716. Yep. I used to not, Meadow says, a, a fabulous bubble magician and just an amazing performer and also a great singer too. If you don't, if you don't know, now you know. Uh, Meadow has said, I used to not want to, I used to not want to be called a magician because I didn't feel magician enough. And I can tell you, I have felt that way. I still feel that way. Who am I kidding? Uh, but that's a great, uh, great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Andre, yeah, Meadow also said, but it also drives me not to feel as much of an imposter. Yeah. yeah. To not feel as much of it. That's very insightful, Meadow. And Andre as well. Human by definition is the opposite of an imposter. Thank you for the wisdom. Yes. Uh, yeah. You, uh, you, you're already a, a true thing. You're not, hopefully, you know, you're not a walking deception. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. I, I have this, you know, Meadow just reminded me, I went to the, you know, I've been performing at the Magic Castle for 30 years, longer. And um, I asked one of the career waiters that has been there 40 years. I said, you've seen everybody. You've seen everybody. Who's the best magician you'd ever seen? And he went instantly, a guy named Carazzini that did the smoke and ball act. Carazzini. He did like six minutes of magic. And when he was interviewed by a friend of mine, he said, that's all I do. I don't do a card trick, a rope trick. I don't do anything except what you see in my act. And this guy was known by this guy that had seen everybody at the Magic Castle as the best magician. So maybe <laughs> it's time to learn six good tricks and you're a magician and just like own it. Absolutely. But you, but you have to take these these tricks to the end of the road and polish them and work at them. And back in the day when Carazzini, and you can see there's a YouTube clip of him doing his smoke act. He did a very colorful character smoke act. And it's right up your alley, Chris. Yeah. You would really enjoy it. It's a real character act. In the old school, which I am from the old school, magicians did the same seven minutes or 10 minutes, tens of thousands of times. Today's camera magicians do a thousand tricks once for their social media. Here's a trick, boom, here's a trick. Next, next, next. There's nothing about polishing, it's getting it down so I can shoot it to put it on social media. It's just, is one better than the other? You tell me. I'm not going to make the judgment call on that. Well, I think that's a great point. You know, take it to the end of the road. And maybe the end of the road is the closest the thing we can get to it feeling like it's real. Uh, maybe that's where the road is taking us, is, is from where it really doesn't feel like it's real to I now think, we're getting there. I try to select pieces and to write pieces and to create magic theater that conveyed more truth than trick. And those are the pieces like the Rainmaker about thirst and our connection to nature. There's a bigger story here than just like, how does it want to get in the ball? My, my, my piece, the hall of mirrors about my struggle to take off my false faces that I created to, you know, 
gain status in the world and then got stuck in this mask to be able to take that off. My piece that the narrative of the Sorcerer's Apprentice where I empower and initiate another young magician of the future that these have stories and narratives that transcend the trick and speak to something that's timelessly true instead of just, here's a, like Jerry Seinfeld, I used to work with him at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach. He'd say, I don't get these magicians. It's like, here's a coin, now it's gone, you're a schmuck. Now it's back, you're an imbecile. And a lot of time, magic is that kind of a, you know, kind of a status game. If I could jump in there, Brayden, I just want to say, I remember, Jeff, you mentioning your Sorcerer's Apprentice is, is mu very much, a um, should I say, a ritual of the, the master carry, uh, passing on knowledge to, to, the, to the student. And I, I love that because I think when I was 20 years old, you actually gave me this at the, the magical empire at Caesar's palace. So I was one of those. <laughs> so I made sure I had this with me because when, when you did that, it, it, it was very much empowering for me. It was no longer just the miser's dream, but it was the passing of knowledge to a young guy like me. And, I and that's no trick. <laughs> right, right. And, and that's no trick. And I was so focused on this and what it meant that it stayed with me for the rest of my life. You know? Mm -hmm. Yep. But thank you. I just wanted to bring that up. That's fabulous that you still have that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, 20, we'll, over we'll 20 Napoleon years. Yeah. We'll go to, sorry, Chris, we'll go to Napoleon yeah. real quick and then we got to run a video uh, yeah. and I'll set the video up. But go ahead, Napoleon. Yeah, I just had a question, Jeff, because you, you obviously have a, a very long perspective on, on what's been happening over the last few decades. Do you think the focus on deception is because people, magicians generally don't do as many full length stage shows as they would have done years ago? You know, the videos we see if you're when we're coming into magic are all sort of like advertisements for new tricks on the Internet. And then we'll see a small set on TV, maybe in some other show, like a variety show you know, is is that why there's such an emphasis on deception, perhaps, rather than maybe the other theatrical arts that go up to a in, into a magic show? It it could be that the online magic industry is fueled by the amateur market and the marketers and the magic companies, and I believe that the demographics show that people see a magic special or two, and then they get online and they start buying magic trick of the week, trick, 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 visual trick, and they have no understanding of magic. So they just buy, 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 buy magic and realize that, oh, it can only be done if everybody's single file and lines up unless I too repeat this on social media. So I think that there's a business model in place now where the magic inventors are feeding the amateur market. And that the, the the people that stick with it, that really transcend the trick and really create crafted presentations, then become the higher, more popular magical performance artists. Yeah, that's what an incredible answer because I I see how easily we can get sucked up into that machine and just get churned and churned and churned and and the next thing you know we. And, 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 and as soon as it goes around, look, I'm going to turn this card into a watch. And then as soon as people get bored with that, then it's a TikTok expose on it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Super, super dangerous. And uh, it's it's much better to, to spend the time and focus and take the pieces that you do all the way to the end of the road. I think that's a fantastic uh, piece of advice. And, Jeff. and the and the other way, uh, the other path to popularity is just to do a trick video a day and to build your social media. But beware, friends, someday you might have to perform live. <laughs> <laughs> and and that there'll be might... people next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and some of these coin things won't work. Right. right. And then you really feel like an imposter. <laughs> and, but I think there's really two worlds now of magic. There's the lifetime performance world and the online performance world, and they both have their audiences. And some people cross over, some people cross over. Um, it's fascinating to watch. However, during the pandemic, during this age in, everybody went online 
everybody went online and only magic was online magic. So that was the only option and outlet for people to even create or perform or to study. I mean, the best way to study magic is live in person with a teacher. That's where people have success and breakthrough. Watching DVDs is, I, is, I don't know any brain surgeon that learned their, you know, profession from YouTube clips. I don't know any professional ballerina operating at a high level that, that really got it from TikTok. Yeah. You know, I think there's a training process, but however, if there, there's a whole nother world of magic that has a real good point of view, the guy, Andy from the blog, the jerks mm -hmm. says, you know, basically, Hey, I'm a magic enthusiast. I don't need to be scripted. I don't need to memorize stuff. I don't need costumes. I'm just trying to make some incredible magical moments for my friends. I don't want to judge every magician that loves magic to become a professional level magician. It's a path to happiness and joy to buy a trick off the internet and to do it over the camera for your friend or to do it for your friend in your living room. And you don't need music and choreography and blocking. You can just have fun with magic and that's okay too. Right. Indeed. And you, you know all about riding and, and getting in tune with what's happening in the world. You've been operating McBride's Magic and Mystery School online, where you have members only have access to over 500 episodes. And we're going to play a clip right now. Uh, and this is from Andrew Goldenhirsch. And he talks us, to us a little bit uh, on episode 127. If you're a member, uh, you can go to MagicalWisdom.com and become a member. But if you are a member, you can go to MagicalWisdom.com, go to episode 127, Guilt in Magic. You did a fantastic uh, treaty on the whole concept of guilt from all sorts of different perspectives. It's really a, a wonderful thing to watch and really Got, get your mind turning on this topic even deeper as you always do. Mm -hmm. And this was about nine years ago we did this. Yeah, so we'll play that now. Go ahead, Chris. All right, playing one. <laughs> do you ever do you ever feel guilt when you do magic? I think we all feel guilt when we do magic. And uh, it, this is something I've thought about for a long time. There's, Me too. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, okay, yeah, there's the old adage, of course, about Jewish guilt. Magician's guilt is, uh, is very present. Uh, it's, it's the nature of what we do. We are in an interaction with other people where we are hiding something. Where yes. Something to hide. And, you know, in, in some ways, how is that different from, you know, presenting yourself, you know, being on a date under false pretenses or, mm -hmm. or, or, or having something fudged on your resume? And yeah, that, that's my Porsche out there. Only yeah. that, uh, some, you know, it, I guess what I'm saying is that by nature of what we do, we are hiding things and lying and lying yeah. uh, and it creates something psychologically in us that creates discomfort that creates well most importantly that can create a disconnect yeah and and mm -hmm. oh god no i was saying that sometimes does it ever cross over into your social off stage because we get so good at deception so good at lying uh, oh, that, that it becomes so easy right. to do yeah, yeah. hmm right well, my what what I have been exploring has kind of been the opposite, okay. that, which is trying to bring the more natural, real-world interactions back into magic and allowing yourself to sort of transcend your own deception. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, let me think of a. Do you have any coping mechanisms to deal with it with the guilt? Kind, yes, well, a few. Mm -hmm. uh, number one. Know your stuff. Get, uh, get whatever it is that. You, okay, we as magicians kind of think on multiple planes of reality, really, and ideally we are able to get that sort of second track uh, as much a part of us and what we do and who we are in our naturalness, so that yeah, I mean our our natural beings, so that. We're able to forget, you know, ideally, right. I mean, your technique should be so good that you are not aware of it yourself. So, so you're not, you, you're not aware of the, of, of, of the, the physical deception or the linguistic deception because you've practiced it enough where it seems so natural. Yeah. 
yeah, because other, exactly. otherwise you have tells. Yeah. People have tells. They have the blinks. Yeah, they have absolutely. little stutters. They have right. little hesitations right. because they know what they're doing is not necessarily above board. So you kind of program yourself to subconsciously run the program underneath the, the social interaction. And it is a program that is natural from the decades that we have experienced in awkward social situations where we are uncomfortable or where we are not telling the truth or where we desperately, part of us wants to get out of there. It's, uh, it reads. It's, it's part of our natural behavior. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's strong. It's powerful. It's, it, it, you were mentioning, uh, well, there's levels of everything. Something that I've found fascinating is uh, <laughs> If you watch, uh, sometimes you watch people do watch steals. Oh yeah. And because all right, think of that. That is kind of the most. It's very risky. It is invasive. You are in a very dangerous place. I have so many times seen somebody do a watch steal, and during the period where they are trying to, they lose the ability to speak English, like because to form sentences, like they mm -hmm. start stuttering and start moving and. I understand it. In fact, I mean, again, th these are things that we've all experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fascinating to see how the realness of it kind of keeps creeping in. And magicians rarely talk about guilt and magic and thank you <laughs> for bearing your What a wonderful uh, episode there, episode 127. And uh, again, it goes into much more detail on that. I want to kick off, uh, feel free to respond to the clip, but I also want to kick us off with a, with a question here. Uh, when it comes to storytelling, and Jeff, you've got a sh whole show devoted to storytelling coming up uh, December 18th, but when it comes to stories, is there deception? And is if there is, is there deception, you know, is it bad? You know, is is all deception bad? And is there deception in stories? Uh, because it's it can be uh, you know an interesting thought. Go ahead, Jeff. I'll quote Bob Neal, who has you know been with Mystery School from the very beginning. And he said, It's I'm not here to make you believe, I'm not here to disbelieve. I'm not here to, it's, we're going to make believe. I don't want you to believe what I do is real. I don't want you to disbelieve, but just for now, let's make believe. And he's authored books on death and dying, you know, the art of death. He's authored books on the importance of play. He's created incredible amount of magical stories. And one of the things that we talked about often at Mystery School and very recently is what do you say to people when they say, is what you just did real? Mm. Is what you just did real? And I had a thread a couple of months ago on Facebook with some of our students about this. And people are saying, no, I just tell them it's a trick, you know, or and other people are, you know, say, and to, to kind of mash up a thought and kind of put things together. Well, would you go to a doctor that didn't believe in medicine? And would you go to a lawyer that didn't believe in law? And why would you watch a magician that didn't believe in magic? Well, Penn and Teller don't believe in magic. Uh, Jamie Ian Swiss and the skeptics and James Randi don't believe in magic, but they have incredible success as creators and performers of magic. However, we're talking about storytelling. We're not talking about, you know, the, the party lines that separate us because one of the things that Eugene said, and Eugene is right here with me every day, kind of, you know, speaking through me. And he would say, magic fosters fellowship across differences. It's not about people's individual party lines. Let's, you know, let's discuss some of this. And one of the answers uh, came like this, and the person on the thread, and I'll have to go back and get their name so I can credit this, but maybe you can go back and, and read this thread on my Facebook, maybe two months ago. When people ask me if it's real, I say, when you go to a movie and you cry, is that real? Is the emotion you're feeling real? 
when you see a theatrical play and you are moved by a story or an actor, is that real? I think magic, guilt, deception has a lot to do with the context that the magic is in. If you are using deception at a seance to make people really believe that you were talking to their real mother, you might be deceiving them in a way that is not ethical. However, if somebody buys a ticket to a theatrical seance where there's a program in their hand, where everybody comes out and takes a bow at the end, that's a different context for the magic. So I think the amount of guilt someone feels or the amount of reality to the magic is kind of proportionate to the context and the contract between the participant audience and the performer. And so that's just something to, to, to kind of chew on. I don't think it's a definitive answer, but you know, it, the, the magical experiences that we create, people feel stuff. However, you can make people a little nuts. And Kim Silverman was doing a presentation of Out of This World with the red-black separation. And here, now you do it. And the person's, oh, look how well you did. You separated the reds from the black cards. And Kim said a month later, the person came up to them rather angry and said, you know, I went home and I tried to do this again and I worked all month and I could not do it. I think I've been tricked. And that person was a little hurt. And Kim told this story as a wisdom story in hopes of teaching us something about when we just glibly say, oh, you did that. You moved. Look how you moved that piece of paper in your hand. Wiggle your fingers. Look, you moved it. Well, people aren't initiated into the, to the, the methods and tricks of magic like we are. So oftentimes we don't know how much we might be disturbing someone's reality. Absolutely. And, you know, what beliefs they have that are built upon the magician's lies um, and deception. Napoleon, what uh, what thoughts do you have on this matter, especially storytelling or anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say, I think, again, as, as Jeff was talking, it goes a bit back to motivation. What is your motivation? Are you giving the audience a gift? You know, um, like, for example, if you decided to have an affair with someone that wasn't your partner, that's deception. But if you didn't tell your partner or you told your partner to go to a certain place so that they, you could surprise them with a surprise birthday party when they walked into the room. Is that deception? Because ultimately you're giving them a fun surprise. I mean, they may react wrongly to it, possibly, but really, you know, you're employing a lie so that you can get the person into that venue so that you could have this surprise celebration for them. So I think, again, your motivation for doing the deception or whatever you're doing, I mean, is a, is a big part of it. And if you're giving the audience some kind of gift, you know, if you're giving them entertainment or you're telling them a story that might help them in their lives, um, or you're empowering the audience in some way, or you're just astonishing the audience, I think that does, that goes a long way to perhaps reducing any feelings of guilt that you might have about deceiving them. And, and, and in terms of storytelling, I mean, there is, uh, there's data to prove that if you present a story, I mean, stories are generally, you could define them almost as life lessons disguised as entertainment quite often, because most stories have some kind of deeper layer to them. And um, when we hear a story, we are sort of conditioned socially to, to sort of go into almost a semi-hypnotic trance. And so the, the things with stories, they, they kind of connect in multiple regions of our brains and they spark multiple regions of our brains at the same time in a way that's sort of presenting analytical information doesn't. So if you present a trick in a very mechanical way saying, I have this thing here and I'm going to turn it upside down and then it's going to float in the, you know, you're, you're not really, you're, you're engaging the analytical brain of your audience. But if you start presenting it as I have this old vase here that comes from China, from the Ming dynasty, and it was given to the emperor as a, you know, you suddenly you're taking people on, on a more dramatic and evocative journey. And, you know, whatever deception you're employing, you can disguise it a bit more because you're taking people on an emotional journey and their brains are firing in multiple different ways at the same time. Yes, and I, I want to go back to what you said, Napoleon, about the intention of the deception. 
the intention of the deception matters. I want to quote uh, from Magic and Meaning uh, from Bob Neal and from Eugene Berger, in which, in reference to magic used in various rituals and going back in the history of uh, the use of magic, the more a trick serves a real need, the less concern of both audience and performer about deception. The less in the interest in deception in this specific way is very deceptive. <laughs> I think that was a very well said uh, on that front. Now we are going to, uh, we're nearing, uh, we're about to wrap up here. So we're going to go to the powerful questions. And then we're going to come back to Jeff and Napoleon for a final thought. All go right. Ahead. Yes. Okay. All right. The powerful questions that we have here today are how can we strengthen the deception of our pieces? So how can we make the pieces that we do more deceptive? Also, how can we lessen our audience's interest in those deceptions? And finally, what need is our magic serving? And Chris, we're going to go to uh, Andrew um, Golden Hirsch for his thought on this, his final thought from the archives of okay. the McBride Magic and Mystery School. Here you go. Close. Okay. <laughs> so one more thing. You wanted one more thing. I, I, I do want to add something. Because as you were asking, like, how do you kind of get yourself out of that, out of that mode? Um, I've, for myself, personally, just on my own little magical journey, uh, I've really tried to make an effort to bring myself, like my real self, as much as possible into what I do. Uh, that, that comes down to, you know, the choices that I'm making in terms of material and, and but, but most importantly, how I'm speaking to people. And uh, it's, a, it's been a long process and it's kind of an evolution of kind of breaking out of the certain sort of magicianal things that we tend to do and getting back to our real selves. And what I have found for me personally is if I am able to put myself in a place where I am like genuinely communicating with the people in front of me, uh, I'm able to let go of those feelings of guilt and, and uh, have it become a little more incorporated into what we're doing, which is, I guess you could say, creating a larger truth with our deception. Ah, that's a good point. Creating but, a larger truth. Yeah, but like being in the ha taking on the practice of truthfulness, of honesty, of being real, just of being in the moment mm. in performance has, uh, because what that also pushes out of your mind is worrying about whether things are going to go right, whether worrying about uh, uh, being caught. We have a, a, a layer of fear that just, again, by nature of what we do, that is always present. We, at any point, in theory, could blow everything. We could blow the illusion, you know? But, again, if we... I found that my way of getting through that worry is connecting directly with the people in front of me in a genuine way, and uh, it opens up everything. I feel a hug coming on. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give you a hug. Oh. All right. <laughs> well, thanks all. Thanks for listening. I love that in all of that, there was uh, that moment of sincerity, that moment of that hug and that embrace. And I think that's so magical. So with our final thought, we'll go to you, Jeff. What say you on this subject that is so rich, uh, guilt in magic and deception and unmasking deception in our magic? Well, you said rich, and that reminded me that today magic is big business, but often it's limited to being just eye candy and saccharine sweet and it can be much much <coughs> excuse me much much more and i want to uh, close with a a quote by george ivanovich gurdjieff the great philosopher spiritual teacher who had a mystery school of his own and eugene <clears throat> would eugene uh studied his books and ouspensky's books and he reminded us that one of the things that magic does is, I have it right here. One of the things that magic does is it teaches people that they are sleeping. And one of George Ivanovich's most famous quotes is, 
People are asleep dreaming that they are awake. And magic challenges people's perceptions and what they see every day as reality. People make assumptions and jump to conclusions, just like you've been doing right now. You see, your perceptions said I had something on this card. This card is totally blank, but your head filled it in. And the glasses do not even have lenses in them. They are fakes as well. <clears throat> the cup never had water in it. It was just filled with confetti. Magic teaches us to wake up and that surprises are around us and we better be sharp or we will be deceived outside of the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful, wonderful. I want to say, uh, before we jump to Napoleon, uh, please go to uh, magicalwisdom.com, become a member of the Magic and Mystery School, and also check out Jeff's full performance, Story Master, on December 18th. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to have a link in the chat for you. <laughs> Napoleon, your final thought. Yes. So getting over guilt. So I, I think better technique better methods, better presentations, and better stagecraft. Those are the four I, I would say, you know, if you want to reduce your feelings of deception. I found this very interesting book recently. It's called The Magic of 1937. And there's an introduction, a little article from the great Levant, a very famous Australian magician. And there's a little paragraph that jumped out at me and it, and it does refer to deception. It said, the public are not interested in complicated or boring problems, but are definitely interested in magicians' tricks that can be used as a vehicle to put across an outstanding personality. It is sometimes to one's advantage to sacrifice some of the mystery of the trick, or deception, perhaps you might say, to gain a laugh or the sympathy of the audience. And I, I, I come from a slightly perhaps more entertainment-focused perspective. So for me, you know, I think the audience is looking to be diverted, to be transported. And uh, occasionally they're looking perhaps for, in my shows, something a bit more philosophical or something on a deeper level. Um, and I think if, if I can satisfy those aims, I think the deception hopefully will take care of itself as part of the sort of the journey to that aim. Wonderful, Napoleon. And you encapsulated uh, my final thoughts at the top, your technique presentation, all of those other things that we talked about. Uh, and Chris, your final thoughts for this. Yeah, evening. real quick. I just want to say thank you to Jeff. And, you know, obviously no book, no, no video or podcast can cover this ground or this issue and teach us how to really perform magic. And if, if people are out there watching, you truly need a master. And I think all of us here have the best master and teacher to, to show us the way of magic. So here, here it is. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and, you know, every, the wisdom that you shared today. So thank you. Indeed. Thank you, Jeff. I will say one final thought before we uh, head out. Chris and I uh, will head out here. When we first get into the performance of magic, we have not yet begun to realize that at that moment, we are the furthest we will be from the origins of the art of magic than we ever may be in our lifetime. Yet at the same moment, we're at the beginning of the path towards finding it. We are either headed down the road, the path, towards it or we're heading further away from it. To quote magic and meaning, all of the arts, performing, literary, visual, offer the state of make-believe that transcends the opposition of belief and disbelief. Ladies and gentlemen and friends around the world, we appreciate you for joining us this wonderful evening I'm Braden Daniels, he's Chris Harness Foss, and we encourage you to keep thinking about magic. Good night, everyone.